Okay, here we go. Welcome to ACT program webinars for health pro healthcare professionals. I'm Robin Geiger, SVP of Clinician Advocacy with Ingenivis Health. The CDC declared insufficient sleep as a public health epidemic. So many of you may not be aware that a lack of sleep can be associated with weight gain and anxiety with the heightened potential for experiencing burnout among a host of other health conditions. I'm really excited to reintroduce our speaker today. Dr. Afalabi Brown is a triple board certified sleep medicine physician and pulmonologist. As a sleep medicine physician passionate about sleep health and recognizing the negative impact of insufficient sleep on mental health and wellness, she founded Restful Sleep MD, where she works collaboratively with families, professionals, and organizations to implement effective sleep health strategies to improve overall well-being and performance. She's a member of American Academy of Sleep Medicine and the American Thoracic Society and has co-authored several peer-reviewed publications. She's a frequent speaker and a member of several medical advisory boards. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Afalobi Brown. Thank you so much for having me again, Robin. I'm so excited. And thank you, everyone, that's uh, joining on. I'll be sharing my slides now. Okay. So we'll get started. I'm going to go right here. And um, just making sure everyone can see my slides. Well, it's sleep awareness week so happy happy sleep awareness week this is a big week for those of us in the sleep field and really for everyone because it is an opportunity to pause and really shed light on sleep and its importance on so many domains of our lives and I really wanted to take that opportunity and I'm so honored to be here with you all today to talk about how we can be our best slept selves and really get our, give ourselves an opportunity to recharge and rejuvenate. And so there will be a few highlights and objectives that I hope you can walk away with at the end of this webinar. The first is that you're able to recognize the effects of sleep deprivation. And also, I would love to have an opportunity to share with you the current state of sleep and mental health based on the Sleep in America poll that was organized by the National Sleep Foundation, because I believe that this is something that really uh, impacts our overall health, our overall well-being, and our mental health as well. And this representation, I'm trying not to spill the beans, <laughs> but this poll really goes to represent you know, normal, everyday Americans and what the sleep state is. And then you're going to leave today with strategies to optimize sleep and well-being for yourself as an individual, as well as within the healthcare space. So jumping right in, we'll start with the first poll, just to kind of get a feel, the lay of the land. And so that first poll or pulse check is how many hours of sleep do you get each night? Uh, less than six hours, six to seven hours, seven to nine hours, and over nine hours. So if you could pick one, this is a judgment-free zone. So no matter where you are, I think it's really just an opportunity to reflect. Some of them are shy out here. So I'm going to end the poll. <laughs> Sounds good. And share the results. All right. Oh, okay. Okay. It seems like we have a fair spread. It doesn't look like anyone gets over nine hours, which given the nature of most of our work and, and all the responsibilities, I'm not surprised. A few people get um, seven to nine hours and it looks like there was a spread between um, less than six hours and, and seven to nine hours. So that's great. I'm talking to the right audience today. All right, so now, the National Sleep Foundation has this great representation of the sleep duration recommendations, which varies by age. And so we know that as young children, infants, you know, we need more sleep. And then as we grow older, the number of hours of sleep that we need decreases. 
And typically in adults, it's expected that you get about seven to nine hours of sleep. And, you know, like Robin said at the beginning, the CDC has declared that uh, there's a national, there's a state that sleep, insufficient sleep is, you know, a national epidemic. So this is really something that most people are not getting enough sleep. Now, coming back to Sleep Awareness Week, the National Sleep Foundation, or NSF, has really been on a mission for so many years now to improve the health and well-being of Americans through sleep education and advocacy. And if you have not visited their website, it is a chock full of incredible information around sleep health and the state of sleep health in the U.S. In 2023, uh, it was the year of your best slept self, and the focus was really looking at sleep and mental health and how to optimize our sleep to improve our mental health. In 2024, they released um, sleep and mental health in teenagers, which I thought was interesting as well. But I wanted to just draw some of this focus to the impact of sleep on our mental health today. Now, we know that sleep is not luxury. So that narrative of waiting to, you know, until we're burnt out before we sleep is really something that has been shifting and it has just been great to see because sleep is a biological requirement of life. No one can exist without sleeping. And it turns out if you do the math, right, if you're getting seven to nine hours, you're spending almost a third of your life sleeping. So we can see that this is something that has not changed with evolution, with every, with all the advancement in technology, our need for sleep has not changed. So that just goes to show how important it is. And the thing about sleep is it is socially driven by various factors, um, environmental factors, societal factors, and interpersonal factors. And that is why, you know, there seems to be a wide variation in how much sleep people are getting. And we could see that based on the poll as well. So the impact of sleep is widespread. It's not just for to cure sleepiness. It's not just something that you're doing at the end of your busy day. It is. It has impact on our mental health, on our physical health, as well as on our cognition and personal safety. I there was someone that sent me an article recently about a flight. Uh, I'm not sure where they were going. I think it was an Asian country where the pilot fell asleep, you know, and it just makes you, it's, it was just so scary, right? So it is a safety issue. The, the, the pilot and the co-pilot, I think they both fell asleep and the flight literally went off track for like several miles. And so when you hear things like that, it, it does, it's not to scare us, but it is, it is a safety issue. In addition to it being sleep impacting us as individuals, it impacts those around us. And there was a recent, it's not so, that recent anymore, position statement from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and the Sleep Research Society, where they looked at the different effects of uh, insufficient sleep on our general health, increased risk of pain, burnout, cancers, mortality, and really goes to say that poor sleep affects us globally. And because sleep affects so many physiological systems, poor sleep then impacts various health outcomes. So increased risk of diabetes, um, obesity, cardiovascular dis disease, as well as mental health. So there's a bi-directional relationship between our sleep and mental health because poor sleep can make worsen our mental health. And then, um, you know, if we have depression or anxiety, it actually can impact our sleep negatively as well. All right, so I've kind of laid a little bit of a foundation on the impact of sleep, why it's important, why we we probably need to lean in a bit to say to see that sleep is not just something we're doing at the end of the day, but this is a, a physiologic need that we all require actually for life. So I'm going to swing right back to the Sleep in America poll. Um, and one thing they observed in 2023 and also in the data that they released in 2024 is that the nation's sleep health 
is strongly associated with the nation's mental health. So you improve sleep health, you improve mental health. And we'll look at the data because I found it very interesting. So again, we know that there's a mental health crisis in the United States and it was exacerbated by the pandemic. But what this is showing is that prior to the onset of the pandemic, right, they had population-based estimates and what they found. So here you see the blue bar is before the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the orange is at the onset. And then October 2022, which was when they collected this data, um, you know, is the green. And so pre-pandemic estimates were about 16% for mild um, depression. And we can see that these estimates spiked all the way to about 25%. And then after the pandemic, it's still high, right? So we can see that in this probability sample, the levels have gone up during the the actual the actual pandemic. It was a, it was worse, um, but has not re returned to the pre pandemic state, um, even though we're you know we're a couple of years removed now. And so what did they want to do, the NSF? They wanted to explore this association between sleep and depression syndrome symptoms. And they used different tools. And what I love about this data is that they used a very representative sample of the U.S. population. And these were the various tools you can see here. The patient health questionnaire, which is a screen to help screen for depressive symptoms. You can use it to measure the severity of depression, as well as assess an individual's response to treatments if applicable. And then they also looked at, they also use a tool called the sleep health index, which is a valid measure that incorporates different th different aspects of sleep, like your sleep duration, your sleep quality and things like that. And then they also looked at the sleep satisfaction tool. And this is a validated tool that really looks at the index of satisfaction, meaning how satisfied are you with your sleep experience? And then the final tool they used was what we call the Best Slept Self Questionnaire or the BSSQ. And this is a relatively new tool that's used to measure how well individuals engage in healthy sleep behaviors. And we'll talk about that in a, in a moment. All right, so the data. I mean, I again, I find it's really, you know, maybe not necessarily shocking, but, but sad, right? And so starting off, what they found was that when they looked at sleep duration and depression, if you see here, just to orient you, you can see there's the red, which is those people that slept less than seven hours. And so that was so kind of, you know, remember we took that poll. So I want you to remember the number of hours you slept and things like that. Again, this is safe. This is just really, I want you to lean in with curiosity. For those who slept less than seven hours, right? Um, that's in red. For those who slept seven to nine hours, that's in green. For those who slept more than nine hours, that's in yellow. And what they found, as you can see here, was that about half of the individuals who slept less than seven hours, so, you know, for mild and the moderate severe was 21%, and about half of them also had mild or greater levels of depression, right? So that really shows that correlation. For those who had seven to nine, they had the lowest levels of depression. And then for those who had more than nine hours also had a slightly higher level. And we have studies that have shown that too little sleep and too much sleep is actually associated with poor mental health. So really, again, this is very representative of what we already know, but I, I, I really was very appreciative of the fact that we see this in a, you know, a representative sample of over a thousand um, individuals in the US. So again, um, less than seven hours of sleep every weekday night was associated with mild or greater levels of depression. Okay, so that was sleep duration and depressive symptoms. Then they looked at sleep satisfaction. So remember I talked about the sleep satisfaction survey just to see how satisfied people were with their sleep. And so those that are dissatisfied is red, those that were satisfied is, is, green, is green. And what you see is for those who are 
dissatisfied with their sleep, right? Mild was 34%, moderate was uh, moderate to severe was 31%. They were more likely to have depressive symptoms than those who were dissatisfied with their sleep. So even if you found like, oh, well, I got enough sleep, but I don't like the kind of sleep I got. I don't have good sleep quality or I have a negative perception of my sleep. It's possible to have that associated with depressive symptoms. Another thing they looked at was at um, you know, difficulties falling asleep, difficulties staying asleep. That's really what we call insomnia, right? Difficulties falling asleep uh, or difficulties staying asleep or early morning awakenings. And so again, to orient you, we see here the green is the those that had difficulties. These difficulties about zero to one days per week. And then the yellow are those that have it two to three days per week. And then the orange are those that have it four to five days per week. And then the red is those who have it most days of the week. And what we can see, right, I'm sure you can see that very clearly, the more number of days you have where you experience sleeping difficulties when it comes to falling asleep, as well as um, staying as, um, difficulties falling asleep, um, the higher the level of depression. So we can see here that almost 50% um, of those who had om ev almost every night difficulties with sleep had higher levels of depression, higher levels of moderate to severe depression. And for those who had difficulty staying asleep as well, that was pretty similar also. So, you know, in summary, if you have difficulties falling asleep, if you have difficulties staying asleep, there's a mild or greater level of depression, which is also interesting. Okay. Now they looked at the sleep health index. Remember that sleep health index really is about those who who are looking at the state of their sleep health. So sleep duration, sleep quality, any sleep disorder breathing. And they ranked it based on grades. So grade A meant you have very good sleep quality index or sleep health index. And then grade F meant you have poor sleep health index. And so you could see here, it's very clear that if you have poor sleep health index, there's a higher level of depression. So it's 37 percent for mild depression, 35 percent for moderate to severe depression. And then if you have really good quality um, or high sleep health index, you're less likely to have those depressive symptoms. So better sleep health, better mental health. Okay. All right. So then they looked at the best slept self and depressive symptoms. Um, the best left self, remember, was that questionnaire where it's like, who are the people that are participating in healthy sleep behaviors? And this is going to take us straight into what are those healthy sleep behaviors that can promote our sleep? And what you find is the same for those who consistently um, participated and high, had a high um, BSSQ. They were A, and then F was those who are poor BSSQ, which is the sleep quality in the um, sleep um, best slept self questionnaire. It's a mouthful. <laughs> and you can see here as well, right? For those who engage in healthy sleep behaviors, there was a less chance, right? Or less depressive symptoms. For those who had a high sleep, a uh, high, um, you know, higher rate of poor sleep, meaning that they were not necessarily engaging in healthy sleep habits, they tend to have more levels of depression. So the perception, if you have a poor perception about your sleep, there's a higher risk of depression. If you don't engage in healthy sleep habits, there's also a higher rate of depression. If you sleep and it's insufficient sleep, meaning you're sleeping consistently less than seven hours of sleep, there's also a higher level of um, poor mental health. So, I think this is a good place to just pause and 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 listen and 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 just look at this uh, quote by Ariana Huffington. She's the author of the Sleep Re uh, Sleep Revolution. It's a phenomenal read. You know, she's a layperson who struggled with sleep and really delved into the science and understood it and wrote this book, which I thought was a real eye opener. And I would encourage everyone to read it. One of the things she said was in the book. She said exhaustion is a sign of chaos not a badge of honor, 
right? If you think about it, because we've had that narrative where we burn ourselves out, we hustle and grind and, you know, we don't prioritize sleep. It really doesn't allow us to be our best slept selves, right? And it doesn't allow us to show up feeling our best every day. And, you know, this is not just about the physical, right? So we talked about the negative effects on our physical health, right? And then we just reviewed the data, very, very new data on our mental health as well. And when we talk a lot about resilience, I'm sure you've been, you may have been familiar with the term resilience and how we need to be resilient and things like that. Sleep is extremely critical for us to build resilience. And what is resilience? It's really that ability to adapt and to move forward even in the face of adversity. So knowing what we know now, what do we do? Like, how do we move forward? Knowing that if our sleep quantity is low, there's a higher risk of poor mental health, right? And the higher our sleep health, the better our mental health. I think everyone listening now will probably be leaning in and saying, yeah, I want some of that. I want better mental health, right? Especially since we're in a mental health crisis, you know, there's so many prescription medications now out there. Mental health uh, practitioners are saturated with the influx of patients they're seeing. What about we take this sort of low hanging fruit and see how we can optimize it? And, you know, it's not to say that you sleep well and then all your mental health issues are going to go away, right? But it's saying, how can I optimize this to then have the clarity, the resilience, the focus to then address other issues that may be uh, impacting my life? So there's a lot of literature out there from various studies looking at um, burnout. And many times when they talk about the interventions for burnout, they usually talk about addressing it on an individual level and as well as an organizational level. And I, I will propose the same. And I work with when I work with organizations, this is really what we drill down and work on. Looking at this from an individual level, because we as individuals have a role to play, but then looking at things in the co context of the societal, the structural, the organizational level as well, will then help us to promote the sleep promoting culture, which can actually tr change the trajectory of our physical health, of our mental health, of our productivity and all of that. So here's the meat of the matter, right? Now we're going to just explore what are those individual practices. For the sake of time, I'm not really going to delve into the, uh, the uh, organizational ones. But it's really about establishing healthy practices, about setting boundaries around our sleep, about going to bed when, uh, when it's most aligned with our circadian rhythms as much as possible, avoiding drowsy driving as well as seeking professional help. And I'll talk about all of this in a moment. But first, we have another poll. So if we could put that poll up, that would be awesome. So in terms of your sleep, what's the main issue you struggle with when it comes to sleeping? Is it falling asleep in time, staying asleep in time, being on a consistent sleep-wake schedule, or maintaining good sleep routine? I'll close the poll and just... A few more seconds. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. All Trying right. Some... Okay. It's a fair spread. Falling asleep in time and staying asleep is seems to be major, uh, quite a majority. And then we have some people struggle with the sleep wake schedule as well as maintaining a good sleep routine. So that is very helpful. You are in the right room. So now, even though it's a sleep issue, right? For most of us, this is webinars about sleep, but I would, I would propose that many times the struggles we have is with setting boundaries. And if we don't determine how to set healthy boundaries, it's going to be hard for us to accomplish or to get restful sleep consistently. And many times I tell I tell people that I work with that sometimes it's not a sleep issue. It's a boundaries issue. It's really 
about setting those healthy boundaries. And boundaries are not a bad thing, right? Boundaries have gotten a bad rap. When you hear boundaries, it feels like it gives the connotation of someone who's, you know, who's kind of selfish and just really standoffish, but that's not the case. When simply put, boundaries are just a way of us communicating our needs to others, including ourselves. And it's not just about telling others what to do, but it's also about holding ourselves accountable to creating the lives we want. Because if we don't have boundaries, if we don't know where we end and other people start, we're going to burn out. And then we're not going to be able to fulfill and accomplish all those goals and things that we want to accomplish. So it ends up impacting everybody else negatively. And when it comes to sleep, it's really about making sleep a recurring appointment that you don't miss. So think of it as I have an appointment with a specialist, right? You're not just going to cancel on them randomly because of a, a trivial reason, right? So the same thing, if your bedtime is at 10 or 10.30 or 11, it might feel tempting to want to take on another movie or maybe you know, call your cousin who you know is going to keep you on the phone for an hour and then you're not going to sleep till midnight. You may feel like, oh, well, you know, they need me or things like that, right? But you also have to put yourself first to say, how can I be better? Because if I'm well rested, I can then call this person back and address whatever issues, right? If I can say there's an end to when work you know, work actually has an end. I'm not bringing work into bed with me. I'm not checking my emails in the middle of the night. Those are boundaries. If you're saying, I'm going to help my child learn how to sleep independently so that they are rested and I am rested, those are healthy boundaries. I'm going to not, you know, binge on a Netflix show that's going to now take me into the early hours of the morning. Those are healthy boundaries. So really, it's about thinking, what are the priorities? Knowing what I know, knowing how much impact in, um, inadequate sleep has on my health, on my wellness, how important it is, is it, and we're going to show up. And so making sure that we show up for sleep in that sense. And then the second piece is really realizing that restful sleep habits start during the day, right? So healthy diets, exercise, mental health, those are all fundamental aspects of our health. And when we're talking about sleep, it's not just about you getting into bed at night. It's what are those things that you have put in intentionally during the day that's going to set you up for sleep success? So an example is light exposure, right? When I'm when I'm talking to people, I'm asking, what time do you does what time do you expose yourself to light? Do you have time when you step outside? Do you have time when you turn your lights on? What is that time relative to when you get out of bed? Because when we expose ourselves to light, especially natural light, it boosts our mood, it boosts our energy. Um, it helps to decrease that brain melatonin production, right? That might make us feel drowsy. And it helps us re-anchor or realign our circadian rhythm. So really making sure that there's sufficient light exposure is so critical. And then our diet, really, I usually would recommend having a healthy diet that's, you know, rich and colorful. Most people will say a Mediterranean diet would be would be a great one because they do have, you know, a lot of fish, you know, a lot of peas, greens, proteins and things and, you know, less of the white starchy processed foods. All those things can impact our, our, our sleep. And I'm going to throw some things out here. If you're ever looking for a snack, uh, maybe you had dinner and you're like hungry, grab foods that are, we call them sort of my melatonin enriching foods. I'm not saying that's going to fix your sleep problem, but I'm thinking, saying if you're, if you're going to snack, you might as well snack on something that'll be healthy. And that might actually boost your melatonin. So things like bananas, oats, turkey, um, you know, some grains, um, some herbal teas. So really thinking, I want us to start to think holistically about the food we put in our body. It's not just about our health. Of course, it's good for our health, but it can actually impact our sleep as well. Exercise has so many benefits. When we exercise, we are first boosting our mood, boosting our alertness. We are also 
increasing our body's ability to generate deep sleep for the night. So you set yourself up for sleep success based on those habits that you incorporate during the day. And then in terms of our mental health, right? One of the things I always say too is, is your mind full or are you mindful, right? It sounds the same, but they're different. Is your mind full, meaning it's full of the clutter, your mind is racing, you can't stop, you get into bed, you're processing all the episodes and all the things and experiences of the day. Or are you mindful? Because when you're mindful, when you have moments to just be, to be calm, to, you know, to either journal your gratitude, all those things can help you build better sleep. It's interesting that we're not getting to the actual like sleep hygiene, sleep habits until the, the number three, right? Because I'm telling you, we got to set this up well, because if you practice sleep hygiene and you ditch the move, the TV and, and you stop drinking caffeine, but you don't set boundaries and your mind is cluttered, you're still not going to be able to sleep well. So create is an acronym I created, no pun intended, <laughs> in terms of healthy sleep habits. Because I love acronyms. I want it to be simple. It's evidence-based. If you Google, you're going to find 20 things and you'll be like, which one is most important? C-R-E-A-T-E. -E. So what does that stand for? C stands for consistency. And this is so important for our circadian rhythm. Having a consistent bedtime and a consistent wake-up time is important. It helps to anchor. Again, it helps you sort of reset to say the day started the light is out, you know, the sun is up, I'm supposed to wake up and then my body knows to fall asleep in the evening. So when we're consistent, even on the weekends where you're not sleeping in, that actually helps to promote better and healthier sleep. And then R stands for your routine. So what does your routine, what's your routine like? We usually talk about this two or three, you don't want to make it complicated, calming activities that lead you in the direction of the bedroom. So these can be examples. I usually will talk about body, soul, and spirit. So body is, you know, you take a bath, you take a shower, maybe you do some yoga, some stretching, right? You nourish your body. Um, you might take a snack, right? But you want to avoid eating anything too heavy. And then your soul is really around feeding yourself with what feeds your soul. So maybe you read a book that's calming. You listen to a nice, pleasant podcast. You talk with a loved one. You, um, you know, you practice some, some gratitude, some journaling, right? And then the spirit really is around what really then helps to anchor you to what you believe is your anchor, right? So it could be God, universe, whatever it is that helps you to be centered. What does that look like? It may look like prayer. It may look like singing a song. It may look like meditation or gratitude as well. So that routine is so essential because it helps take you from going, going, going to, okay, the day is over, it's time to wind down and it cues your body for sleep. And then E stands for the environment. So what is your bedroom environment like? Is it cool? Because if you're hot, it's going to be hard for your body to wind down to sleep if you're uncomfortable and it might disrupt your sleep quality. Is it dark? Why is that important? Because our brain produces melatonin. It's kind of like the darkness hormone. So when it's dark out, then our brain melatonin starts being produced. So your bedroom has to be dark for that to be efficient. And you may need to create a dark bedroom environment for yourself. Uh, you may need to get blackout shades or dark curtains or um, a sleep mask or something of that sort to really create that um, darkness as much as possible. And then it should be noise free, right? Are there interruptions? Is there a spouse that's snoring? If there's a spouse that's snoring, you want to get them checked out. <laughs> In the meantime, you could get earplugs um, or something just to mask that noise, or you could get a white noise machine if that's something um, that you feel would be beneficial. A stands for assign the bed for sleep and sleep only in bed. So what are we doing in bed? Sometimes, especially as busy professionals, we're bringing in our laptop, clackety, clackety, clack. Once the kids are in bed, then you start to, your, your third shift of the day, your finishing notes, you're signing off, you're responding to emails, you're doing all that in bed. 
or you're scrolling on social media while laying in bed or you're watching TV for hours and hours in bed. Or some people sleep, eat in bed. You're eating in bed or you're arguing with a spouse in bed. Now, our brains make very strong associations. So when we do those things in bed, when we then get into bed, our mind is going to race. And so that is what I find is a very common cause of people either not being able to sleep through the night or they complain of, I can't shut my mind off. My mind is racing. Yeah, because your bed is like, I don't know what we're going to do right now. Are we sleeping or is it email time? Or is it time to worry, right? So you want to try to assign the bed for sleep and you want to sleep only in bed. T stands for tackle technology. Now that's our whole talk, right? We do know the impact um, the blue light has on, on, on our brains, melatonin, how devices, right? Phones, computers, um, the TV, all those things can disrupt our sleep quality, can cause an increased arousal and make it hard for us to settle down. So you really want to eliminate technology use. I usually will say about 30 to 60 minutes um, before bedtime. And then E stands for eliminate. So really you're looking at what are the things in my life right now that could be disrupting my sleep? right? Am I drinking too much caffeine? Caffeine is a stimulant. So that might stay in my system for a while. Am I drinking alcohol to put myself to sleep? That might disrupt your sleep after a while. Or nicotine, that's also one that's been a sleep disruptor. And then am I eating too close? So if you're eating a very large dinner just before bed, you're going to have reflux and discomfort and that's going to affect your sleep. So that's E. So what's the goal? It turns out those within the seven to nine hours category are, are right on track. Yay! Too little is not good for most people. And too much is also not good. So seven to nine is the sweet spot. But it's all about, I think I always will take a step back and say, what? How does? how do you feel? Because if you sleep for eight hours or for seven hours and you still feel tired, you might need more right? And you might sleep for nine hours and still feel tired, right? So it's really about finding, tailoring this for you. And I always recommend the best way you could tell is take what I call a sleepcation or a sleep vacation. And that's totally made up. And what is that? Maybe you have a long weekend coming up where you don't have to wake up to an alarm clock, where hopefully you don't have little kids that are going to wake you up and see when your body naturally wants to wake up and naturally wants to go to sleep right? And usually that will help, you know, and that tends to be a big eye opener for a lot of people because they're like, oh yeah, doc, I, I, I only need six hours. And then they go and they try this out like, oh my gosh, I need eight hours. I started to feel sleepy at about um, 11 p.m. and I naturally woke up at about 7 a.m., right? So it's really an eye opener. And when you figure that out, then you can start to tailor your schedule and go back to number one, which is set those boundaries to make sure that you're getting that amount of sleep every night. And then number four, I added this recently. I think it's important to see how well you're doing. Check in with yourself. This is something we don't do that often as busy professionals, right? We are going, we are solving problems for everybody. We are doing all the things and we never stop to say, okay, how am I doing? How's my energy level? What's my productivity, my focus, my mood like? What can I do about that? How's my sleep, right? Am I feeling, am I waking up tired? Am I feeling sleepy during the day? What is going on? And then based on that, you can make adjustments to improve your sleep. And there are different ways to do this. You know, there's sleep diaries, which we, within the sleep space, that's definitely something we try to use because we want to just get an objective uh, idea of how you're doing in terms of sleep, right? Uh, there could be wearable trackers, um, smartphone apps also, um, sometimes you may use bed-based trackers. And in some situations, we may need to do home sleep studies. And I think it's important, though, that as you do this, whichever one you choose, you really have to figure out your why. So are you tracking your sleep because you're just trying to augment, you know, your health a little bit? Or do you have insomnia or sleep difficulties? And now you're becoming really obsessed with the data 
and now it's causing more harm than good. We have a term called orthosomnia. This is when people start to perseverate and fixate on their sleep data um, versus how they, they feel. So if I'm working with a team and everybody is obsessed and their the sleep data is causing them anxiety, I'm usually saying, just back off. Let's not, let's just listen to your body. Um, because a lot of these trackers, that's the other caveat, they have these algorithms that are like, almost like secret. We don't know what the algorithms are. And when you compare them to lab-based sleep studies, we really can't, we, we, it's really not clear how much they correlate. If you're using them, you know, your, your aura ring, your, um, your whoop, right? Your Fitbit, whatever it is. It's really more to look at trends. Like when was I going to bed? Okay, I made this change. What does that look like, right? I would rather we use it for that rather than to get hardcore evidence on, on what's, what, um, what's going on, right? Now, the other piece is caffeine intake. I wanted to shed some light on that because uh, we have to be strategic. Caffeine is good in the sense that it's a stimulant, it promotes alertness, it enhances performance. Um, and you also have to realize that caffeine is in various substances, soda, coffee, chocolate, tea. Um, and when you say decaf, that doesn't mean caffeine free. So you've got to make note of that because that just means it has a lower concentration of caffeine. Because you don't want to be <laughs> seeing noises. And that's one of the things that could happen with excessive caffeine intake right? It disrupts sleep because it's a stimulant. It stays in our system for so long. And as a result, we may develop tolerance. It also has some diuretic effects. So you may be getting up and peeing a lot and wondering why. And then it does have neuropsychiatric effects as well. So you might, you might be seeing what's not there, right? Irritability, tremors, and perceptual changes. So be careful. Usually what I recommend is if you're going to take caffeine, is that it's earlier in the day so that it, you have enough time to get it out of your system before bedtime, usually a half-life about six to eight hours. So, I mean, typically after noon or 1 p.m., depending on your bedtime, you want to be done with caffeine. Uh, because we are within, you know, uh, speaking to healthcare providers here, I have a few tips for those who do work night shifts. The main thing is you really need to protect your sleep because we do know you're not going to get enough sleep as um, a shift worker. And so taking a pre-shift nap is always important. When you're, especially if you're doing an overnight um, shift, you want to expose yourself to bright light therapy early in the morning. You want to also engage in strategic caffeine intake before your shift. And then other things, um, you want to try to avoid any excessive light exposure after your shift because you're going to head straight home. Uh, because what that now you're going to be going to bed opposite your um, circadian rhythm, right? When you're supposed to be awake, this is when you're supposed, you're going to sleep. So make the room as dark as possible. Practice healthy sleep habits. And in some situations, you might consider melatonin. So there's a concept of anchor sleep, and I'm just going to highlight it here, especially for those who, um, you know, who work frequent night shifts on a long term. And really, it's about establishing a system where you anchor, you 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 have this anchor sleep on your days off, where you're not completely reverting to normal sleep schedules, even on your days off. And what that does is it partially re-entrains your circadian rhythm. So for instance, if you were working 6P to 6A on your days when you have your shifts, and you typically go to sleep on at 7 a.m. to 3 p.m you know, when you get home, your anchor sleep is going to capture both. So you may end up going to bed from about 3 a.m. to 11 a.m. on your days off instead of completely going back to the normal schedule, such that that 7 a.m. to 11 a.m. is still within your, your anchor zone. And this is something that I really recommend you work with with a sleep specialist, but I just wanted to put that out, out there. 
And then another thing you might want to do as a shift worker is opt for a clockwise rotating shift, which is better and more tolerable than anti-clockwise. Uh, a little bit on melatonin, uh, because there's so many brands, it's really, really, really been just out there in such a, just a pervasive way. It is the exogenous melatonin, which is the melatonin we get from the stores is not a, um, you know, it's not, a, it's, it's, it's not necessarily FDA approved in the US. So you just have to be careful about the concentration. There are some conditions where melatonin is approved by the ASM, things like delayed sleep phase, jet lag. It has some benefits with shift work, not enough data really to recommend it for insomnia. And if you're going to use melatonin, I would recommend to do, to do it with your healthcare provider. So here is something that I don't want us to definitely not cover, which is the sleep disorders. So I've talked a lot about sleep habits, how to optimize your sleep, sleep health. But if you have an underlying sleep disorder, none of those things will really matter. So what are some examples? Insomnia. What is insomnia? Difficulties, falling asleep, staying asleep, or early morning awakening that's associated with negative daytime effects. And so if you have been going on with this issue, I mean, occasional nights of insomnia are normal, but if this is a condition that, you, that you've been experiencing, I would say for over three months, this would be a time to reach out to a sleep professional or talk to your doctor and say, we got to work on this. And then there's also sleep related breathing disorders. So obstructive sleep apnea is the most common. Obstructive sleep apnea is grossly underdiagnosed. It's when you have pauses, snoring and pauses in your breathing while sleeping. And uh, while in the past, most times when you talk about OSA, you're thinking, um, you know, white male, middle aged. No, not at all. Children are at risk. Women, especially postmenopausal, are at risk. Um, obesity is a risk factor, but it's not necessary. It doesn't necessarily have to be there. And so if you're having difficulties with sleep, and I saw that about 31 percent of people had reported difficulties with staying asleep. I want you to lean in. You might have a, a spouse that says, yes, I snore. If that's the case, you definitely want to get a sleep study because that can contribute to nighttime wakings. And it has a lot of negative effects on our heart, on our mental health, and so many other things if it's not treated. Hypersomnia or excessive daytime sleepiness may be a sign of narcolepsy. Um, you can also have circadian rhythm disorders, which is sort of that night owl that's now extra. So um, two main groups of circadian rhythm disorders are the, we call it almost like the night owl syndrome, where people are just not able to fall asleep normally until very late. So maybe like 2 a.m. or 1 a.m. And then they prefer to wake up really late as well. We see that in a lot of our teenagers, but we'll see it in adults as well. And then the other one you might find is adver um, advanced sleep phase where it's 8 p.m. and you can't keep your eyes open. We see that more in the elderly, but we can't see it in um, middle-aged folks as well. Another sleep disorder you need to be weary of are the parasomnias, which is abnormal behaviors during sleep. So sleepwalking, sleep talking, sleep terrors, nightmares. Uh, you know, bed wetting, all those behaviors, especially if it is um, impacting your daytime performance, is definitely worthy of being evaluated. And then we also have sleep related movement disorders like restless leg syndrome or periodic limb movement. So if you're having any kind of discomfort before sleep, or you have discomfort that's disrupting your sleep, it's worth speaking with a sleep physician because it might be an underlying uh, periodic limb movement uh, disorder or restless leg syndrome. And then there's a category of other sleep disorders because this list is not exhaustive. But I think I would start with this. If we were to draft a workflow for this or a flow chart, it would be that one, if you are having difficulty sleeping, make sure that you're practicing the basics, practicing the healthy sleep habits, okay? If you've done that for a couple of weeks and you're not seeing an improvement, it would probably be time to get yourself evaluated, right? Another thing I did mention is medications. So there are medications that can make it 
more difficult for you to sleep or contribute to your sleep difficulty. So really having that discussion with the provider is important. So just like the um, the pilot and the co-pilot that fell asleep while they were flying a plane, we definitely don't want to be driving drowsy. And there are different ways by which you could tell you're, dry, you're drowsy. You might have troubles focusing on the road. You might have difficulties keeping your eyes open. You might find yourself actually nodding or blinking your eyes from time to time. And that's what we call micro sleeps. You might be yawning repeatedly. Miss, you may miss signs and exits. Or you may just completely be veering off the lane. Or if you find yourself closing your eyes at stoplights, you may actually be more sleepy than you think. And at this point, because drowsy driving is as dangerous as drunk driving, it's important that you just pull off as much as possible. And even if it's to take a five minute nap, um, that's going to ensure that you're safe. Then that's something that I would recommend. So. We've covered a lot, and I hope this has provided um, just a, a bit of a perspective on why it is important for us to get good sleep and to realize that it's within reach. It's, um, it's making sure we get back to the basics, but also making sure that we set the right boundaries, making sure that we reach out for help if we're having issues. Um, if it's your responsibility to get enough sleep, because we owe it to our community, we owe it to the patients we take care of, we owe it to our families for us to be the best version of ourselves. Um, if anyone has questions, of course, I'll be happy to answer some, um, but here's my QR code. I actually, one of the things that a lot of people complain about is that mind racing. Um, and I created a, uh, it's kind of like a free resource that helps you to tackle mind racing at bedtime. And I would love to gift um, you all that are here. You would need to just get that from my website and you can download it and have it straight to your inbox. And um, yeah, thank you so much again for having me. So I, I, I forgot that I, I was not on mute anymore. I almost said a couple different things because I want that free resource. Thank you. The, <laughs> the racing, especially when you have kids, when you're mm. when you're working, when you have projects that are due, and yeah. and you're they're showing you all the love. I've been seeing all the Aww. reactions throughout the presentation. <laughs> you did have a question about um, sleep apnea and making sure you know could they have more information about that? Um, that came from Brendan, and you already had that embedded into your presentation. So I think we were able yeah. to answer that. If not, Brendan, we have a few more minutes. Um, but mm -hmm. you did have one or two questions sent forward, and I know we're we're really short on time, so I'm going to mm -hmm. give those to you now, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. So one question was, uh, um, it says, what's the right amount of sleep? Greater than nine is too much. Less than seven is too little. What if the number of hours of sleep is constant, constantly changing? Some nights, mm. five hours of sleep. Hmm, that's a that's a great one. So you remember, I I one analogy I paint is think of your sleep like a shoe size, right? If you, I wear a size nine, nine and a half, and if someone tries to fit my feet into eight, it's going to be very uncomfortable, right? If someone try, if I try to wear a size eleven, it's gonna I'm gonna trip, right? So, it is literally the amount of sleep you need to help you be the best version of yourself. What does that sound like? It's the amount of sleep you need that helps you to stay alert, helps you to stay productive, where you're not falling asleep during the day, you're not relying on caffeine, and you're able to stay focused. If you get sleep that's um you know little, and you find out that oh around, you know, you know, I don't know, 4 p.m., I could barely keep my eyes open or on my drive back home, then that probably means we need to get checked. You, we need to get you checked to say maybe you need more sleep. But then the other caveat is it's not just about the quantity of sleep. It's about the quality. And honestly, if I were to choose, and if anybody were to, if I were to choose for even for you, I would rather you get Okay, now six hours is not ideal. Six and a half is not ideal. But I would honestly <laughs> rather you have six and a half hours of high quality and restful sleep than eight hours of very crappy sleep. 
You know what I mean? So <laughs> it's not just about the quantity. The quality is also something that's really important. So if you're waking up and you're constantly tired, try to get more sleep. Try to follow those healthy habits. If you're still struggling, I want us to kind of delve into what's going on with the quality. Is it insomnia? Is it another medical disorder that we need to address? I hope that helps. I'm sure that will help. And then there were uh, a few thank yous. Thank you for the shift sleep tips. Thank you. Thank you. And then one person, you know, what if you have a new baby? <laughs> That's going to be challenging. We all remember that. That was a yeah. question. What if you have a new baby who's sleeping, who's up at night? So I hear you. I mean, I'm a pediatric sleep expert too. So I, and I work with a lot of moms. You're going to first show yourself grace. The few things we talk about, you're going to have to ditch imperfection. You're going to have to ask for help. You have to, even if you're a superwoman and you're used to doing it all, this is a whole different experience. Because children, babies, especially the newborns, don't have an established circadian rhythm. So you can't, I don't even recommend sleep training them. You really can't until they're a little bit older. So during that season, I think going in knowing, okay, I'm going to be a little bit short on sleep, but how can I get the most? So think about like, even if you're a shift worker, like what I said, you protect your sleep. So with this, with a new baby, we need to, because if we don't sleep well, for newborn moms, there's a higher risk of postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety, unfortunately, suicidality. And so you're not going to be present for that baby. So we need that so much so that we're going to invest in getting help, ditching imperfection. Um, people talk about sleeping when the baby sleeps. I really don't think that makes any sense, but you can rest. You could not go to the kitchen when the baby is taking a nap and <laughs> trying to wash some bottles or do some laundry. You could, mm -hmm. when people ask how they can help, you could give them tasks and say, come hold this baby for me so I can take a 30 minute time for myself. Absolutely. So it's really important. And focusing on your mental health is also very important during that period. Thank you so much. And, you know, I, I think we always run out of time with you because I mean, the presentation is amazing. You pack so much into it and we, we really appreciate all the information, all the questions. They can always email us at act at .com if you're trying to reach her, if you have additional questions, um, as well as her QR code is on screen so that you can um, actually get in touch with her. Thank you for that free resource too. We've certainly enjoyed our time with you today. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Happy Sleep Awareness Week, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Until next time, everyone. Be safe, be well.